step. Let, let's start exactly on time and make it a tradition of uh, our sessions, which are uh, which we start today. So I welcome Bezod Kashimov, who is the member of the International Economics Olympiad Jury in 2019. Uh, my name is Daniel Sodorich. I'm the president of the executive board of the same Olympiad. Uh, and today we have this talk with Bezod, with this uh, lecture or conversation, uh, we will start the series of meetings with uh, different interesting people, which are somehow connected to the IEO community uh so well, when io went online when we decided that we conduct this uh event remotely this year uh it became clear that we must uh share whatever we have with the world because it's very easy now everything is online so it's easy to share easy to scale that's why we will conduct a series of meetings which are available to everyone around the world and uh, not only to the IEO community. Uh, we are all in the different time zones. And we received over 100 questions from all over the world, from Indonesia, Russia, Uzbekistan, United States, many, many countries. So clearly we won't be able to cover everything today. Uh, but anyway, I hope that this will be useful and interesting. We all are in different time zones. So if some of your friends are in the time zone, where uh, right now it's, uh, it's dark night, so they cannot join live. Don't worry, the recording of this meeting will be uh, published on our YouTube channel uh, and our Facebook page, which I encourage everyone to follow. Uh, Bezod, by the way, what time is it where you are now? Uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Nine in the morning. So you woke up early to uh, participate in this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, so the timing of our event is the following. We will, uh, Bezot will start with the presentation and the topic that we, uh, the, the topic that we had specified is uh, something about the sources of economic knowledge. So how can you uh, learn economics from, not from the textbooks, but rather from the media, from the um blogs and so on so how do you tell which sources are reliable and uh, worth to read and then we will I, I, this will take maybe 20 to 25 minutes then we will discuss questions which we received upfront which we received before uh the meeting as i said uh, there were over 100 so we won't be able to cover them all but i i tried I will try to select the most interesting ones and the ones that Bezod won't have covered by them uh, in his talk. And finally, we will have some time for the discussion of questions that we will have in our chat in Zoom today. Um, uh, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, also, if you ask a question in the Q&A, we will read it. So it's not a strict recommendation not to post there. I see the Q&A. Uh, window, so I will be able to read the questions, and if they are interesting, then uh, we will discuss them here, and maybe we will even promote someone to panelists, so you will have the chance to ask a question uh, so that we see and hear you. So I won't uh, waste time for the organizational issues anymore. Bezod, the floor is yours, please. All right. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Daniel, for introdu introduction, and thank you all for um, attending. Uh, it, it's great honor actually to be presenting to the IEO community. I'm a very proud, I would say, a member of, of, of this community and I will try to talk about um, what do I read, how do I read about, about say, uh, economics. Um, if, if you see the title of my presentation, it's called Publicism and Economics. Um, the word publicism is apparently very old and not used in English anymore, but in Russian, for example, a lot of people know the word publicistica. And when you try to translate it to English, there is a few translations like you know nonfiction and so on. But 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 here, when by I mean publicism, I mean you know uh, public writing of economists to the general audience. Not not only writing, speaking, and and, and so on and so on. So this is efforts of economists to say outreach to the more broader audience. I would want to call it publicism, but you know you may call it differently. And uh, I will try to take 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, I'll go over slides, but I will try to be faster than, than slower so that we'll uh, yield more time to discussions and so on. Arguably, uh, I think we are living in the golden age of economic publicism. 
What I mean is that a lot of economists are writing books. Many of them are coming to podcasts. A lot of uh, econ related newsletters are out there. Uh, there are many newsletters that uh, contain working papers. So I'll, I'll talk about it a, a, a bit later. Uh, many economists have blogs. Uh, a lot of them ha have opinion pages in the newspapers like Bloomberg and New York Times and Wall Street Journal and so on. Um, some economists are doing videos uh, on, on YouTube and a lot of them are also in social media like Twitter. So I will, I will go over uh, to, to the each of this, but let's start with books and why I'm saying we are living in golden age. Now, um, uh, many famous economic researchers are writing books and this is a relatively new trend. Uh, and you know, when I was an undergrad, uh, I, I, I try to study economics. I was in the math uh, department. I wasn't an economist in, in my undergrad. And I was trying to study economics and uh, there weren't too many books at the time. I mean, there were a few, uh, but th there weren't that many. And interestingly, uh, this observation was kind of weird. And I actually asked James Robinson, who is an author of Why Nations Fail, uh, when I interviewed him for, for my podcast uh, about that. So I asked him like, what's going on? Why a lot of economists are writing books? So. Uh, so this is a question I ask. So I, I, I'm, this is this is a quote from from the interview. So I say, you know, when I was looking for books and I was undergrad, um, there weren't too many. But in three to five years, there are so many books written by economists. Uh, what happened? Why economists are writing books? That that's the question I asked James Robinson. So that that's the moment, and that's his quotes. And I mean, uh, I, it's too much of text here. I don't want you to read it. The point is that this this slides will be uploaded, so you'll read it later. That's 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 why. But what what he says that. Um, uh, he knows that this is true. So he agrees with me that economists are writing books and he doesn't know why the equilibrium shifted. So he says, you used to be told if you're a professor uh, that writing books is a disaster. So, you know, nobody reads them. It's not good for your career and so on and so forth. But something changed and um, people start writing books. And uh, what I like here is that um, people told us, uh, so to Achemoglu and Robinson, that uh, writing a book was a waste of their time. Uh, and he says, so, I mean, to, to, to just end this conversation, James Robbins says, I don't know why everybody's right, uh, doing it right now. No matter what's the reason why economists are writing books, I think we are living in a great age because we can now actually read them. I mean, again, the reasons why they're doing it is, is unknown, but, um, at the end, we as a community can, can actually use it, can, can read it, can, can, uh, you know, think about them and so on. So again, I'm trying to make a case to my statement earlier in the social media that I said that we are living in a golden age of economic publicism that a lot of economists are actually writing for people who are not professional economists. Usually when economists communicate with other economists, they do it using, um, so-called papers. So they write a research paper, they do analysis, and they publish it in, in, in economic journals. And it takes like three to five years to get there and so on. It's like a really complicated process. I don't want to get into that, but there was a usual way of communicating. Right now, a lot of economists are actually writing a book based on their research sometimes, but sometimes even the books precedes their research. So they didn't even publish the papers that are inside the book and they publish the book first. And I think that has to be uh, um, problems with the economic publishing overall. So this is a non-exhaustive list of books that I read recently. Uh, I mean, there, there are a few of them that I didn't read, for, uh, didn't read like completely. So I didn't read the um, uh, Narrative Economics by Robert Schiller, uh, Jean Tirole's book I didn't finish. Uh, I mean, I start reading it and I lost the book. The Great Reversal uh, is also a great book. I didn't uh, also read, but I think other than that, all, all of them I read, uh, except for the Adam Tooze book. But anyway, so the, this um, generation of like free economics, like when uh, Stephen Levitt and Dubner started writing, all, uh, so those books are by, most of the books that are here are by uh, very, you know, uh, famous researchers. They're not like journalists and so on. So like whatever the book title you see here, um, they're, they're active researchers who, who do it, like, like the book by... Dixit and uh, Nalboff is one of the, my, my favorites, like thinking strategically and so on. There's a lot of books going on, um, uh, being, being written as we speak too. So that's why I think this generation who are in high school, who are just starting their college and so on, you're really lucky. Why? 
So if you say want to study uh, what Thomas Philippon is, is studying, right? He's a professor at NYU and he's an IO professor. And you take out his uh, research paper and you want to read it and there's like structural estimation and there is like, um, you know, difficult econometric models uh, that, that goes on into it. And you as an undergrad or a high school person uh, may not be able to understand what's going on. You don't, you may not understand that like a deep idea behind the book or, you know, if you want to read Duflo or Banerjee's papers, I mean, they do randomized control trials and so on. And again, most of their papers are about, are designed to be read by professional economists. So that's why most of their time they spend on telling to other economists what they did in their research rather than like general discussion about research. So in a, in, in a typical paper, there'll be like a short paragraph, what it means to the society, but most of it, it will be about, oh, okay, we did this robustness check, we did this statistical analysis, here's the proof, and so on and so on. So you don't uh, get a lot of um, meat, if you will. And again, uh, when I talked to James Robinson, I asked him this question, I said, uh, do you think Why Nations Fail is just a book of things that you, didn't, you, didn't, you couldn't put in the paper? And he said, yeah, almost, almost that. So basically what they do is like when they are doing research, they uh, learned a lot, but there weren't a place they can put it that into the paper. So if you are writing an economics paper, you can't really put that institutional knowledge into your paper. But now you're lucky that say, you don't have to know IO economics to understand the point behind the great reversal, or you don't even have to read Piketty's papers to understand the capital in the 21st century. It's just a very, uh, very simple. S same thing I think goes with uh, Daniel Kahneman's book and so on. So if you, if you read a paper by Daniel Kahneman in 1979 in Econometrica, uh, they will be like, oh, okay, this is a utility function that economists used to write and so on and so forth. And, and again, the audience is primarily professors. They, they're not going to say, you know, there's a system one, there's a system two. But in a book, you understand what's going on. So what I'm trying to say here and maybe sell here is the following. If you think about being an economist in the future, or if you want to just learn economics in the future, uh, what you're lucky at is that you know what these economists are doing and where the field is going by not necessarily studying four years and being able to read papers. So to read a, a paper in economics, you need quite a bit of training either in econometrics or mathematics. It's not that very trivial, like, like a first year freshman usually can't, uh, I think, really understand what's going on. I mean, I, there are exceptions, obviously, but what I'm trying to say is just the level of sophistication of papers is quite high. So that's why uh, books are, are great. And uh, a few advice about books, right? So I think I should spend too much time on, on this slide. Uh, many active researchers are writing books for the general audience. And look for authors who are active researchers in the area, not for know-it-all and analysts or so. Why I'm saying this is this. Like, for example, um, there's this book called Who Gets What? See this uh, yellow book? It's written by Al Roth. So Al Roth is a Nobel laureate who does like mechanism design, matching models and so on. And he's the one uh, who designed this system of kidney exchange in the United States where people who have uh, problems with kidneys, like every, every human has two kidneys. And when somebody has a problems with his kidneys, one human being can donate it to another one. The problem arises is that when people are related, they can donate kidneys to each other. And only people who are unrelated can do it. So he created a market without money for the kidney exchange. Obviously there are papers that he written that requires a lot of mathematical sophistication to read. But the fact that just of what he did was in that, uh, was in that book. And why I'm saying you should read uh, books by active researchers who are in universities, primarily because uh, university professors book for the general audience uh, will have a lot of nuance. You'll learn a lot. And uh, if you, uh, as a rule of thumb, like for me, is like if there's a book that says macroeconomics in 10 pages or like a YouTube video that says 30 seconds to learn everything about banking, that's a bad sign. That's, that's not a good sign because the world is really messy. The world is not, um, is not very simple. And so when people try to uh, simplify it, sometimes they may simplify it in a way that actually hurts you. So the, the books that I showed you are about very niche topics that are very deep. So you will have a lot of knowledge about very um, intricate details about what is going on in the field or what's, what, what happened into, to institutional details and so on and so forth. So uh, I think as a rule of thumb, um, I mean, I, I read quite a bit of this book from know-it-all analysts, like, you know, economic, oh, I worked in Goldman Sachs and stuff like that kind of books. 
and they don't give you a lot of nuance about the world. They, they paint the world like a black and white, but the world is much messier. So that's why I think it, there is a value in actually reading uh, books that are in niche topics. And most of the economists write books for niche topics. Um, in niche topics, sorry. Podcasts. So this is a non-exhaustive uh, list of podcasts that I like and I listen to. Um, and again, uh, I advise you to listen to podcasts. Uh, so th th this is a list of podcasts, and, I, and now I'll tell you why you should listen to podcasts. So podcasts are a great re uh, resource to listen uh, uh, to conversation about niche topics. For example, school choice models. There is an economist called uh, Parak Pathak in, in MIT who, who designs, say, how children should be allocated to schools in, in Boston. And he goes into podcasts and describes the model. It's a very, very niche topic. I mean, usually uh, people don't want to uh, don't want to talk about stuff like that uh, in, in in a cocktail conversation. But but it's it's really interesting. Uh, it's convenient. You know, you can walk, do stuff while listening. And the best thing about a podcast is that there is a lot of pushback. So when you're reading a book, you're basically reading what author is laying out upon you, right? The author argues about stuff. The good thing about a podcast is that there is somebody else who will challenge uh, the author. So, or, or, or things that uh, they may not be clear. So when, when somebody does research in one field for a long time, they have a lot of blind spots in terms of what human, other humans understand. So, um, you know, in, in many fields, like if, if you are, a, say, a professional journalist, you, you tend to think a lot of people also are like you who are involved and a lot of people are clueless about the world and so on. So the same thing happens to economists too because they're human, right? So when they study mechanism design, uh, they know what is, uh, what is a incentive compatibility means or something like that. But let's say general um, audience may not know that. And the good thing about podcasts is that for a lot of the times the podcast host will challenge the, the guest or sometimes they would try to clarify it. So the, when, 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 when they use terminology or when they use something specific, the, the host of the podcast would say, hey, can you like, Tell us what, what, what you mean. So the, the pushback will help you to learn a lot. So again, though, this is, this is the podcast that I listen to and, and they, they, they not necessarily represent the, the whole world of, of, of podcasting. But I, I usually learn a lot. I get inspired. I'm not saying, again, like uh, when you listen to podcasts or read books, you'll be a great economist. What I'm saying, though, is that uh, you will know a lot of nuance and you know that... Uh, the world is not is not uh, it's pretty messy. So those those podcasts like Econ Talker, um, he uh, Russ Roberts introduced a lot of economists that are very interesting, uh, that have very different ideas and so on. I like conversation with Tyler, but it's not very economics things. You know, he interviews you know uh, artists and and literary people. The new one, Capital Isn't. It's it's I think brand new podcast um, by Luigi Zingales uh, and uh, I forgot her name a professor in Georgetown University, and they talk about, um, you know, what's wrong with capitalism or what's right with capitalism. It's a really interesting podcast. Again, we are living in a golden age of economic podcasting. And I, I can't even, even like three years ago, there weren't too many podcasts, like honestly, like the, like say capitalism is just brand new. Obviously, free economics is old. Uh, NPR's Planet Money is very good because they're a professional radio host. It's like a, a, a like a radio station. They're very cool. And there are a lot of niche podcasts that I didn't put in, like say there is a podcast about uh, economics and law or like economics of crime or, 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 and so on and so forth. You, you have to do your homework in terms of that because I didn't put it prim primarily because I didn't listen to them. So I didn't want to vouch for them. This podcast that I hear, I, I actually do listen to them. So what I did is basically I looked through my phone and I'm like, okay, what podcast do I have? And then just put the, put the pictures up. So um, I mean, there are, there are some podcasts that I listen to that are not economic, but, um, uh, but many of them are. So, um, so yeah, listen to podcasts. Uh, okay, newsletters. This is a great source of informa uh, information. They, uh, newsletters are something that you subscribe your email to, and then they'll give you a lot of uh, new content. NBR is a National Bureau of Economic Research. It's, uh, it's a research think tank in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts that actually gathers a lot of working papers. Uh, and there are, if you want to subscribe to their newsletter, you can select topics that you're interested in, very niche topics like entrepreneurship and innovation. That's, that's something I care about, so I subscribe to that. 
Um, and they will send you papers every Monday. Uh, like it's usually like a midnight or whatever. It's like a weird time. Your, your phone will ping and that's probably an NPR. Um, and then they have a digest for a month. So they actually uh, write in a human language about what's, what's going on. I'll tell you why this is important. BFI is a Becker Friedman Institute in New Chicago. They also have a newsletter about research. And again, I really recommend subscribing to newsletters by university and, uh, and business schools because uh, those newsletters are based on the university's research. And so university's researchers will publish a draft of paper and some um, type of communication people will write about the papers. Uh, I personally am subscribed to UCLA Anderson and Kellogg's newsletters. Uh, they're very great. Uh, I'm sure there are more. I don't know why I have UCLA Anderson and Kellogg. Uh, maybe it was uh, something that I found uh, along the way and just kept, kept it that way. But um, I actually enjoy it. I mean, there are a lot of good, good articles. Again, those are articles that are written about research. They're not pure uh, dr drafts of the working papers. Those are hard. The uh, descriptions are pretty cool. I think Harvard uh, Business Review has uh, stuff like that too. My personal favorite um, pod, uh, sorry, newsletter is by Matt Levine. He is a Bloomberg opinion writer, a great writer actually. He writes about markets a lot of times and, and uh, it's, it's really cool. The other though, um, the other informative uh, newsletters is uh, by Fed. So US has a lot of uh, Federal Reserve Banks, I think about 12. Uh, you know, Chicago Fed, Minneapolis Fed, Kansas City, uh, Richmond, uh, Atlanta, I think San Francisco. So there's a, I think there's about New York Fed uh, and every Fed has a newsletter on their research and, and, and outreach, right? So if you want to increase your financial literacy or if you want to know more about stuff, uh, I would personally recommend subscribing to uh, Fed. I think I'm subscribed to Minneapolis Fed and um, and New York Fed, if I'm not wrong, but the Minneapolis Fed is pretty cool. I mean, they they do interviews with like a cool, uh, very good economist. Like uh, recently, not recently, like maybe eight months ago, I read an interview of uh, Katz, uh, economist at Harvard, to Minneapolis Fed about something about labor economics. It, it was very cool. I mean, it, it wasn't uh, too uh, like you can read it in your in your spare time, but but it's it, but it's substantive in terms of in terms of content, you will enjoy it, I, I hope. So <clears throat> um, now working papers. Now this is for more advanced uh, people, I would say. Uh, one thing about economic research you have to understand is that a lot of papers that you read in the top economic journals like AER or QJE or, or Econometrica, they're written um, at least three years before the publication. I mean, I'm, I'm just being very uh, generous, maybe even five years. So usually what happens is an economist would write a paper and it will be a working paper for like five years until they put all these belts and whistles that leads to a publication. So most of the discussion in economics happens on the working papers. So people actually cite each other's working papers too because the publication process takes a lot of like ungodly uh, long amount of time. And that's not the conversation for here. Why, why, why is it the case? But the point is that <clears throat> you should treat working papers seriously. In many fields, uh, people don't treat working papers seriously because they're not published and, and so on. But in economics, people actually treat them uh, seriously. And NBER is, a, is a, uh, actually a gold mine of, of, of uh, working papers. Why I'm saying this is that <clears throat> when you read a, a, a journal, you might say, oh, why are these guys are talking about things that are you know, not really relevant and so on? Let's say COVID, right, like a coronavirus. Uh, if you open an AR, I, I don't think there will be any papers on, on, on coronavirus right now. Because if, if somebody have, uh, has worked on this field, uh, the probability that this, their coronavirus related research will be published like now is really low. So it will take them two, three years to get there. But there's a lot of coronavirus related working papers that are in NBR or in working papers. So um, I would recommend reading those. Um, again, if you are a reading paper and you say, don't wanna read math and stuff, Reading conclusion and introduction is usually pretty good. I mean, it's fine if you don't if you don't read the equations and so on. You'll learn a lot still. Um, okay, <clears throat> videos. Uh, a lot of great courses are going on right now in uh, platforms like Coursera. Uh, I think even Daniel has experience with that. Maybe he will tell more about it. Uh, many universities upload videos of talks and presentations. My personal favorite is when I was undergrad, I listened to Robert Schiller's lectures in finance. Uh, and there was a course in MIT in microeconomics. I forgot who was uh, 
who was a lecturer, but that was what that was awesome. So they had all these lecture notes and so that. So uh, here I say I listened to them a long time ago. At that time, it was the best uh, content I found. Now, for all there are many more. Uh, for say high school students, I think Marginal Revolution University is a great source. Uh, they have uh, very good uh, videos, very informative, very fun. Han Academy has uh, stuff like that, so you can use a lot of videos uh, in there. Again, <clears throat> rule of thumb, try to listen to economists who are actually in some kind of universities or departments. So when I'm saying rule of thumb about books, if, if you really want to know about economics, I would really advise you to like look for who is an author. Like if an author is an active researcher or, or, or uh, a university affiliate, the quality of the book will be higher on average, I'm not saying all the time, on average, than uh, if an author is a um, so-called practitioner, because sometimes you don't know what's, what's going on. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you as a person who had an experience reading uh, a lot of stuff that I, I think was a waste of time. And I don't, so since I read them, I don't want you to read this. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a good idea and good use of time. So again, Videos are great. Uh, some people really like to listen to videos, and I think they're great, you know, entertainment plus education. So as an entertainment, I would, I would treat them as, as, as pretty good. Please, uh, yeah, yeah, again, look for university-affiliated videos. They usually have um, higher quality uh, of content because when uh, you are just coming to the field, it's really hard to distinguish, I would say, discriminate or differentiate the quality. Uh, so I'm wrapping up right now. So this is our blogs. There are a lot of blogs that economists are writing. Uh, those are my favorite blogs. So Marginal Revolution, Conversable Economic, Economist, Vox Dev, it's about development economics. Um, Econ Browser, it's a UW Medicine professor, uh, Min Zi Chin, it's very good. Econ Log, has a lot of uh, authors. I really like uh, some of them, not all of them. Economist View, I think it was a New York Times, uh, kind of part of the New York Times opinion section or something. Um, Greg Mankiw's blog is cool. He doesn't write often, but there's a lot of things you can read from the past. Uh, Grumpy Economist is also pretty interesting. So this is, this is a, again, non-exhaustive list. So every, every list I'm giving you is non-exhaustive. Maybe I'm just uh, forgetting something. Maybe I read something I, I didn't put it in there. Just whatever I had, I just uh, typed in. Um, now, the, that's a final slide, but I know this is super important. In 2020, econ, hashtag econ Twitter, is something that you have to uh, watch carefully. So a lot of economists are now on Twitter and it's a great source of knowing what's going on. It's even better than working papers. Remember I just said uh, before that uh, there was a problem with the papers being published. It's like three years old papers are being published. Working papers are something that's written like six months ago. But econ Twitter is something that's going on right now. So a lot of people say, oh, I'm writing about this and that. There's a lot of discussion going on. There, a lot of econ professors have Twitter accounts and I would really advise you to follow them all and see what's going on. There's a lot of uh, debates. There's a lot of uh, not nice exchanges there, like people insult each other and so on and so forth. But, but that's, that's human, right? You know, economists are human too, and they have other uh, things that humans have, you know, striving for hierarchies and getting influence and so on. So uh, tw Twitter is, 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 uh, is economists in the wild, basically. You just can, uh, just can look at them, what they think about, what their sentiments are. It's a good public forum uh, for many reasons. First, they publish their working papers. Then they publish uh, like jobs and stuff like that. So when they're looking for a research assistant and so on, a lot of them do actually post it on, on Twitter. And there is like actually Twitter pages that says Econ RA, they're looking for a research assistant. So yeah, go on there uh, and you will see uh, what's going on in the field from, from in depth. And then you will see a lot of links and sources that are vetted already by a fellow, let's say, uh, professional economist. So I think that's a, a really great source and I would really, really uh, encourage you to, to go on there and just disregard the politics and so on. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, it, it's kind of really awkward to present uh, on, on the video. Maybe I, I was rambling too much, maybe you didn't hear me. Maybe the whole conversation wasn't even recorded, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's really hard to know without feedback, but that, that's all. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions and, and comments. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Big Zod, very much. Uh, don't worry, everything went very well. Everything was recorded, so you will be able to watch it yourself after we finish. I think that uh, there was a lot of very interesting stuff. And the first thing that I want to say uh, is that I really hope that you share your presentation with us. So all this 
non-exhaustive list of sources will be available to our community. And moreover, I think we should make some kind of, a, I don't know, wiki or something like this, where everyone uh, will be able to share their favorite sources in economics, uh, because tastes differ, you know, even in your talk. I, uh, I personally don't like the MIT microeconomics course. Uh, if we're talking about the same thing, it's by Jonathan Gruber. Uh, I watched it when I was already a lecturer and microeconomics was the field of my teaching. And I saw very many things that, uh, well, I will put it mild, I would do differently in my teaching. And, and I think that, uh, well, uh, th this, was not the, this was not the best course online which I watched. Uh, Gruber is a specialist in health economics, and when he uh, arrives at the topic uh, of the asymmetric information, things like that, he is very good. But in the, in the beginning of the course, the basic economics topics, I didn't like many of the things that he did. My personal favorite is the game theory by Ben Pollock. He's a professor at Yale, and this is a, an old course from which I myself learned a lot, a lot how to teach game theory. I recommend to everything. It's completely available. Uh, it's, it's published free, you can access it uh, right away, and it doesn't require any background at all in anything. So uh, th there is a lot of, there are a lot of things around which, uh, w which you can access. And the, the main problem nowadays is not the access to the information, but rather it's lack of time. Uh, and uh, now uh, we, we, as I said, had very many questions and uh, I uh, encourage everyone to jump in with your questions in our chat. Uh, I will now go through a, a, a few topics which I personally find uh, most interesting and most related to the talk that you gave. Uh, first of all, you pro well, I, I got two main ideas from your talk. First, there are a few ways to learn economics outside textbooks. And second, here are, here are non-exhaustive links, links that Dagnod Kashima personally likes. That's great. Uh, it will take a lifetime to study all these sources. But my question, and this is the question which was mentioned six or seven times in, uh, in, in our question list, which arrived before the talk. How do you actually tell which, if you're not a professional, how do you tell which source is reliable and which is not. And I will, I will clarify this a little because uh, many of the sources, including the ones that you've mentioned, are often criticized for their biases. For example, the, my favorite and your favorite blog, Marginal Revolution, is very often criticized for being extremely poor market, uh, while other platforms, other sources are criticized for being socialistic. So how don't you lose your head in all this a uh, bunch of different sources which you can read and how do you don't fall into the trap of starting to believe what the author believes rather get some unbiased information so what do you think i think it's uh, i think it's a great question daniel um uh i think in terms of uh ideology and stuff like that uh one thing i know is that the the delta of differences within economics is not as high as within the society. So what happens usually, let's say marginal revolution is being criticized as, as, as a pro-market or whatever, but it's, it, it looks very socialistic to a libertarian blogs. So what I'm trying to say is that um, when, when a professional economist who is writing about um, a stuff, they usually have have uh, some idea about methods. At least the way they think about the world is different. Like say, Greg Mankiw thinks very differently than Paul Krugman. But I, I, I'm subscribed to both. So like I get a newsletter from Paul Krugman. Actually, that's a good idea too. It's very political. I didn't want to put in there. But Paul Krugman is a great writer. So you, like, you get a lot of uh, cool information. And Greg Mankiw is also a very great writer. So what I'm trying to say is like, if you, uh, as, a, as a first approximation, my advice would be look for, again, people who have, you know, PhDs in economics or uh, whatever, Nobel prices or whatever, and then um, and try, try to listen to them. Usually, the, they will have some ideology. They are human. I mean, there, there's a huge difference between, you know, Milton Friedman and Joe Stiglitz, for example. But um, the, the, their both points are kind of valid. Like, you will learn a lot by just comparing and contrasting. What I really don't want people to fall trap into if in YouTube you say how to study economics or whatever, usually most of the sources that come out are like 
weird. Like there's conspiracy theories there that says, you know, Fed is ruled by aliens and stuff like that. And then there will be like uh, people who say, you know, we should go back to gold standard. And so the, the range of information on the internet is much larger than the range of information within say economics community. So that's a good news. I mean, there is a, a lot of uh, diversity in thought, which is good, I think, for, for a lot of uh, young people. But, uh, but, 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 but I think it's kind of healthy in terms of uh, uh, the methods. I mean, the, the disagreements, say, between uh, Greg Mankiw and, say, Thomas Piketty, which Greg Mankiw wrote about, uh, is informative as much as Thomas Piketty's book is informative. So I just put uh, uh, both uh, in there. But, but again, uh, whoever I put in there, I, I'm... Not a person who's like an institutionalist that says, you know, if if person is not a professor, you don't listen to them. But at this point, I'm saying this. What I'm trying to say is that uh, for if I'm a young person and I want to know who is trustworthy, I would just go by university. Like if if somebody is affiliated with some university, that's not a crazy approximation. Usually, there are not many crazy people within, say, university communities. Uh, the probability that you will stumble upon something really crazy and wrong not affiliated with the university is higher. So just conditional probabilities will tell me that. Um, but then you will learn, you know, uh, I think uh, on the way, like like you learned about the difference between Piketty and Mankiw without, say, any guidance, I'm sure, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, well, the next question will be, well, I, I agree that the range of um, different views within the economics profession is uh, is not so wide as in the society, there, maybe there are no crazy extremes if you read or listen to some professor from Harvard or Yale or Wisconsin Madison, they, they won't be so crazy as uh, well general, uh, general people might be. Uh, but still, they are pushing different views and uh, well, they, have, they have different agendas that uh, couldn't be argued. Uh, do you think that this, uh, these activities actually, that people are spending their time writing blogs, uh, recording podcasts, do you think that uh, this somehow has uh, impact on the popular views, on, the, on what people think? Because the main, uh, I, I often hear, I, I talk to many people, especially who are science communicators in STEM, in biology, for example, they, uh, they are trying to push some ideas. For example, that GMO is not so bad, that you should actually vaccinate, uh, so things like that. And they say that most of the time they are preaching to the choir. That is, the, you are talking to the people who already agree with you. And it's very difficult to reach those who think otherwise. They just won't start listening to you once they, once they find out that you don't belong to the part of the spectrum that uh, they themselves belong. What do you think? Is it possible to reach those who don't want to be reached by, by you? I think it's a great question um, uh, because I think about it all the time too, uh, and uh, and you're right. Maybe uh, maybe it's it's it's, uh, it's just a selection problem. Like people who are already selected into believing that they are just uh, listening. But on the other hand, uh, again, there is anecdotal evidence of of me personal uh, evidence that when I read uh, Why Nations Fail by Chemo and Robinson. I actually wanted to be economist. I mean, I wasn't in uh, I was in a math department and stuff like that. So when I read the book, I was like, man, this these guys are studying something really, really fascinating. Now, of course, I'm not doing something like that right now. And I'm in the business school. I'm studying entrepreneurship and probably will be uh, trying to get a, a job as a business school professor, not like an econ department. But still, um, they changed my uh, worldview about stuff. And again, it might be a selection, right? The, the, the fact that I agreed with a lot of things was that from personal observations, you know, I lived in Uzbekistan and so on. Uh, I, I already was, uh, what was a, a chore, right? I was, I was, you don't have to preach me to, to believe into that. Like I knew it, but it kind of, all these dots got connected when I, when I read those books. And there are a lot of um, Russian economists like, you know, Sonian and Gurif and stuff that had books that I thought were, were, were fascinating because, uh, the way they think about the world uh, was helping me. And so I think there is obviously a value in terms of communicating the ideas. And I think, uh, if anything, I think economics uh, as a profession is underselling uh, its worth, in my opinion. So the things I, I described is a very tiny minority of economics profession. So there's like a lot of people in the departments 
even in the top departments like I know, Harvard or MIT, in which 90% um, of the faculty will never write a blog, will never publish a book, and will never go on to podcasts. So uh, we are talking about a really tiny minority who are doing that. And again, uh, as Robinson said, people are, are being told that you're crazy if you're doing that because it uh, basically makes you vulnerable to you know, public criticism, uh, to you know, some types of ostracizing within your profession and so on. But I think overall, as, a, as marginal revolution usually writes, so like in equilibrium, I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I, think. I, I mean, we, not, we can't change people's opinions probably but we probably can um, strengthen the, uh, the ones that, that exist. And, uh, oh, sorry, let me just ramble a little bit. I think in my opinion, maybe there's a speculation. Uh, I usually, I used to think like this. So uh, let's say I buy economist argument, but let me re read about people who I, I, I disagree with. And I used to read like some BS stuff, right? And I, I wanted to know to, how to understand them. But I find it very little, uh, very, not very valuable. So if you have an opinion about stuff, I would uh, actually argue that spending more time engaging in things that you agree with has a lot of, uh, has more bank per buck than trying to uh, read the points of people you disagree with. Because once you kind of uh, do research on things that you, you really, really buy, then, then there you will understand the flaws uh, deep uh, flaws better because you'll go deeper. And I think uh, studying things that you agree with is not bad. I mean, in my opinion, again, it may be wrong. Yeah, thank you. I think that's that, that, that actually a great answer uh, to my question. Let, let's let's uh, switch topic a little. Uh, we had a few question about, questions about undergraduate economics education. I do know that you haven't gone through undergraduate economics education, that your undergraduate was applied math, but still maybe you know something about how things work uh, around the world. Uh, and maybe this is very much connected to our topic today. Uh, it's, often, it, it's often sad. I often hear from my students and uh, I read it uh, all over the internet that economics education, the undergraduate economics education in many places, in many, even the best universities is too theoretical. That is, there are a lot of models, especially in the first and second year. There are models, models, models. It's microeconomics. It will maximize ability. In macroeconomics, there are all these derivative and stuff. So you have to uh, talk about with your professors. You talk about the things which have very little connection to the real world. And only by the end of your studies, you face subjects like behavioral economics or um, finance, things which are very, very connected or more connected to reality. Well, do you think that we should, uh, well, we as, uh, as, as the opinion leaders in uh, economics education and, uh, and our colleagues as well, do you think that we should push the idea of, uh, of moving from this ivory tower of uh, theoretic models and push more like the popular sources, like you recommended, more popular discussions into training of young economists. This maybe also applies to high school because in Russia, they know the situation very well. And the textbooks which are written for high school students, they also are too theoretical. They employ a lot of derivatives and much less so uh, conversation about real work. So do you think that economics training uh, in general should change in this direction towards more popular content, more, uh, more science communication than math? That's a good question. But in my opinion, I think uh, this should be not a substitute, but a complement. You know, economists study that. And I think uh, reading blogs, listening to podcasts and stuff should not uh, be your main beef, in my opinion, and should be more of a complement. Why I'm saying this is the following. I met a lot of people who are fascinated with behavioral economics. Uh, I mean, high school and, and, and undergrad, so when I was in Uzbekistan and I was talking in university and so on. And what I realized is that a lot of them don't understand the, the, the classical economics. So I think to appreciate the behavioral economics, you ought to know what they are waging war against. Like, uh, it's, it's a new strand of, of knowledge conditional on you knowing the old strand of knowledge. But it's really hard to appreciate, like, for example, that humans are irrational. Even, even like uh, a grandmother knows that uh, humans are not rational. Like that's like absolutely obvious point that 
a behavioral economist would make if, if you say, you know, people are not rational, they, they eat too much of cashews and so on, if you, if you read like Tella. But this, uh, but, but if, you, if you're from the econ's kind of ivory tower, then you're like, oh yeah, they aren't. And, and then you appreciate stuff like that. So I think um, to be able to read Marginal Revolution or to listen to podcasts and so on, there's more value, in my opinion, if you have some type of models in your mind that you can like use them. But, but you're right about the, the dryness of, of economics education. And I think it is, it's, again, very deeply psychological insight. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm reading some books about how human minds work in terms of communication. And I find that our mind uh, is very uh, wired into understanding the, wor the world with fables and stories. Like we can't understand stuff without stories. So whenever you present a model to a person, you basically have to tell the story about the model. And those sources will get you this beef of stories that you can analyze using the tool. So I think, again, I think those are very complementary things. Maybe the textbooks would be better off by putting the real world examples of whatever the issue is. And, and, and if you remember in the, in the presentation, I said, um, uh, basically Robinson and Chemoglu put together a book because they couldn't put those contents into the papers. So there is a lot of, things that we know about the models that we don't want to present. We know the examples, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, giving an example in anything is bad because you know there's like a lot of contrapoints and so on because that's why you want to concentrate on math because if you give an example using words, there is there is inconsistencies in the way you speak and so on, so you don't want to give it. But I think there is a value in uh, in, in giving that. So if, 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 if I want to answer shortly, it's a compliment, not a substitute. If I uh, want to answer uh, more, more longer is that it depends on where you are in the equilibrium. If you are too into stories, I would say that every additional learning of model has a lot more pay, higher payoff than listening to additional blog or whatever podcast. But if you are on the, this side of the equation, when you very fast in optimizing, then you'll get a lot more um, bang per buck if you just go and listen or read. So. So it depends who we are talking to. <laughs> yeah, this was a this is a, a great uh, end of your answer because this was an example of marginal analysis, uh, <laughs> which can be perfectly understood only if you have taken a coin one on one or something like that. Do you think that there is any use in reading uh, economic history textbooks or history of economic thought? They are two separate things. But is it is it is there any point in reading Adam Smith today? or books about Adam Smith? And uh, unfortunately, so um, to my shame, I never read uh, Wealth of uh, Nations uh, and, 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 and even the theory of moral me, me neither, me neither, no problem. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean like uh, a lot of people actually don't, under, uh, especially in Uzbekistan, uh, I hear people think that uh, studying economics is studying economic history. So like they think you read Marx and Smith and Milton Friedman or like you don't, like I never seen an economy, like, there might be a lot of uh, professors of economics who don't know, like say, uh, who, like maybe Hayek or something. Like there, there, there could be a lot of economists who never read a, a page from, from Wealth of Nations. And, and, and that's, uh, again, whatever the field is. Um, what I liked, uh, uh, there was a book, uh, I think it's called The Worldly Philosophers. Uh, that's about uh, a few economists. It's, it's an interesting book that I would recommend. Maybe I should put it in there. I, the, the reason I didn't put it in there is that it's not recent and it's not by an economist, but I think that was an interesting point. Um, I'm actually reading a book by Sylvia Nazar. Uh, Sylvia Nazar is actually Uzbek, uh, if you know. Uh, her father is uh, Ruzi Nazar and her Uzbek name is Zulfia. Uh, and she wrote about um, John Nash. And there's a movie called uh, Beautiful Mind. I mean, she's not Uzbek in terms of like the way, but her, her dad was uh, fighting World War II and then he escaped to United States and then and so on. So it's a long history and, and she, her father is, is from, from Uzbekistan. Um, and that, I mean, this, that's not how I know her, but basically she has a book new, uh, not new, but a uh, uh, recent book, I think, uh, on, uh, on histories of few economists. It was interesting, but again, I, I, I don't, um, I don't think it hurts to know what are the roots of those uh, issues, but unfortunately, I'm not the right person to tell because I don't know a lot of economic history, unfortunately. Uh, I have an advisor, his name is Brent Goldfarb. Um, he's a professor at uh, Maryland. 
and he in the business school and he uh did econ in stanford but he did like dissertation in economic history and and in his opinion um economic history is underrated so i would just uh trust him i Stand think he, he, he okay. could be right yeah yeah uh okay uh what do you think is uh, the the most useful so this is the question is by the way from uh, the usa from our participant of the first IEO, uh, so I will quote him, uh, uh, it's Adam Sirvastava. Uh, what are the most important non-economics courses that an undergraduate economic student, in your opinion, should take to improve the understanding of how the world works? So what, what, what won't they teach you on a mandatory curriculum? What, what, what are the courses which you take uh, besides a mandatory curriculum? I think I, if I was uh, if I was in, in, in their shoes uh, and, and whatever I know now, uh, except for math, like everybody knows that math is important, except for math, I think there are a few things that you should study probably that I, I, I'm under read in this. Um, psychology is probably important. So like to know how, how, how people behave uh, from from like a deep psychological point in terms of communication and so on is important probably. Other social sciences like anthropology is also has very interesting methods that uh, may may be helpful. Uh, sociology is uh, too, like, you know, uh, when we model, uh, usually a lot of times economists model like individual preferences, but there's also a lot of social preferences that I think we don't appreciate as much because some uh, behaviors that humans exhibit are not due to individual optimization, but they're in their individual optimization function, there's a huge social construct there that people try to optimize and the the consequences of that is uh is quite obvious like a lot of phenomena from you know uh, conspicuous consumption to uh, stuff like that was studied under sociological lens uh before and i think this is understudied so i would i would study like philosophy and like logic i would study sociology i would study psychology and anthropology so th those are things that uh, people won't talk about like everybody's like the, the traditional answer would be okay you have to study math analysis and computer science and programming and whatever that that may they may be useful but i think uh the underrated part is, is is social sciences so like uh you have to increase your toolkit and it's not my idea necessarily so there's a a person whose name is uh steven durloff he's now in chicago he was a wisconsin professor and when i talked to him i asked him the same question and he gave me the, the this answer he said uh, economists are severely underread in psychology, sociology, and, and uh, anthropology. And he's an editor of Journal of Economics Literature. He's like a very kind of uh, important person in the in the profession, and and, and he thinks so. So I think uh, Durlo uh, is a person that's worthy listening to, and, and that was his answer, I think. Yeah, well, maybe this is because economists often view other social scientists as some under sciences, something like uh, they, are, they are talking about the same subjects, but, but we have more advanced methods. We have all those beautiful econometric models and they don't. So maybe that's why they are underrated. But I completely agree that studying other social sciences can improve your understanding of human behavior uh, much better than studying only economics. So uh, we, should, we should wrap up in a few minutes. So I have a few short questions and I'm waiting for short answers. Uh, the first one is, if you were to recommend only one single book to give to your, to someone's grandmother, uh, so she can somehow have an impression of what your grandson or granddaughter is studying in the university uh, in the e economics department, so what this book will be, only one. I actually gave to my grandfather Why Nations Fail and he enjoyed it, so. Why Nations Fail. Uh, okay. Uh, but well, why nations fail is a is a is a specific field. It's institutional economic history, so this is basically about how nations fail. Uh, and do you have any advice on the uh, well, the, the economics itself, the traditional understanding? Uh, well, more on the like econ one hundred one, not uh, not the institutional thing. Huh. huh okay. Uh, that's good. There was this uh, book. I don't know who's the author. Uh, like an, there, there was a few books that I really like about economics 101. Uh, one is uh, Armchair Economist or something. Then there was a, a book called. Uh, yes, I think it's, it's an interesting book. Uh, and that's, that's fascinating. And then there's one, Undercover Economist. And then there was a book called uh, Common Sense Economics or something. So there's, mm -hmm. there's three books, I think, 
are really econ 101 ish and then people will understand what you're doing from that but I, i'm not doing kind of econ 101 stuff and i'm not doing even institutional stuff so it's really hard to say this will help my grandmother to understand what i'm doing that's not true but this will help her to understand what's 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 up with economics in general i think that the, the that's a part of the book that that's the book. Okay, yeah. Is there, is there a book which explains uh, to your grandmother or grandfather what you are doing? This entrepreneurial econ economics. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I I don't have an answer to it. Because uh, I'm too okay, much into so the weeds. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, then we should be waiting for uh, this kind of book by Bezo Kashimi. Shouldn't we? Yeah, hopefully. In, in, in a few years. Yeah, in a few years. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. Hopefully. Do you have Do you have the time to read fiction? Uh, I so the the thing is I'm a really bad time manager. Um, you know, one of the worst in the world. Uh, and that's why. Uh, yes, I do have time to read <laughs> to read fiction. But you don't. But you don't read. <laughs> no, no, I mean I, I actually do. I do read some fiction. Uh, I just read fiction for enjoyment. And I, and actually I, I read nonfiction also for enjoyment. I mean it's not that I read economics books just because I like want to be <laughs> economist. It's just like I find that interesting. I find it fascinating. Um, and so yeah, I I do read some fiction. I read. Uh, I try to read fiction in the languages that are, that are not English, so Russian and Uzbek. So in, in Russian, I read Davlatov, for example. I sometimes even reread Davlatov because the way the prose is uh, is, is just it's just wonderful. So um, yeah, I think I don't, I don't read a lot of English language fiction, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe the last question. Uh, I really enjoy personally, and I recommend to everyone your YouTube channel where you, you interview. Well, now you are being interviewed, but uh, your uh, well more common way to spend time is interview someone else. Uh, and uh, on this YouTube channel, there are uh, your conversations with uh, with well, economists which are top in their field in the world like James Robinson, which is what mentioned a few times, uh, well, the people who are famous in Russia, like uh, Sergei Guryev and Konstantin Sonin, very famous economist here. Uh, it, it, and from, from, your, from these conversations, it seems that they are like easygoing people to whom every person can speak and learn from them. So my question is, is it easy to reach people like this? If, for example, uh, I am just a, well, a high school student from Indonesia, and I have a question that only James Robinson or only Robert Schiller can answer. Is it possible that I write them an email and expect that they respond? Because their emails are published on their university pages. It's easy to find. But do you think that they actually have the time for this um, science communication to, to regular people? Is it actually easy to reach them and get responses if you're not based on Kashima with a YouTube, YouTube channel? Of, Several thousand. Uh, actually, I'm not. I'm not that famous as you are trying to describe. Like nobody knows me, so that's that's the first uh, wrong assumption I would say. The second thing is that uh, those people that you mentioned, uh, I, again, I didn't write them uh, cold emails like uh, uh, James Robinson. Why? Because I am translating his book to Uzbek, and I have a legal right of why nations fail into Uzbek language. It's not I am translating. I'm just like overseeing the translation process and I ask him to to speak and then I invited him to Uzbekistan. He was supposed to come in September and we would have presented the book and coronavirus happened, so probably not. Uh, same thing is like I met Achem Oglu and I wanted to invite him to a podcast and actually I emailed him recently, he didn't reply. So that's that, I mean, I met him and I talked to him like an hour, uh, for an hour uh, last year. Um, he was very, very generous with his time and so on. So I invited him to a podcast and I uh, didn't get a reply from him. Maybe hopefully I'll get it soon so he will be on the, on the channel, I, I hope. Um, but uh, actually, I don't know. That's a very great question, but I never actually emailed a professor uh, without somebody kind of introducing uh, me to, 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 to them. Uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is that if, if you have a question to James Robinson, uh, you should email, in my opinion, uh, because the cost of emailing is really low. But on the other hand, if he is receiving it, uh he might be like uh, feeling guilty to reply and so on so i don't know what's an equilibrium answer here because uh not, not let's not say james robinson because he's busy i'm sure and then 
it, it will be weird if I'm promoting that everybody emails him because he'll be you know overwhelmed. But generally, if if you find somebody interesting, emailing them probably is not a bad idea. So uh, I can tell you who I emailed coldly. Do you know Tyler Cowen who runs Marginal Revolution, right? Marginal Revolution. Uh, so I have a channel in on Telegram, and I write about economics in Uzbek. I have about um, ten, not ten thousand, maybe. Uh, let me see how many. I have about thirteen thousand subscribers, like as of right now. And when I started the channel, uh, it was taking a long time. And then I just called email Tyler Cowen, said, "Hey, I'm a um, you know student from Uzbekistan, and I." created this blog and I'm writing it. Can you give me some tips and so on? And he replied, it was like shocking. And um, so, yeah, so I had one experience and uh, one, and he, he did reply. He's a, he's a really busy and famous person. Uh, but other than that, I never uh, emailed anybody. And, and obviously I'm waiting for Tyler Cohen to be a guest in my podcast too. So, hope, so tune in. So probably Tyler Cohen will be there in the next few months or something. Well, that, 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 well, that's great news. I would like to hear your conversation with him. Actually, that's true, because I follow his uh, writing with MR since I was an undergraduate student myself. So, okay, thank you very much. This was uh, Bizot Kashimov, our guest for this conversation for the IO community and beyond. This was the first conversation of the series, but uh, later we will have a few more. Uh, answering the question from the chat, yes, the slides will be distributed. I hope that the result will be so generous to do it with us and the video recording as well. So thank you all very much for attending. Again, thank you, Bezot, for being with us. Uh, well, see you next time. Uh, thank you so much. I, I will have to cor correct some uh, spelling errors in my slides. I just saw them. So. Well, okay. We will allow you there we'll, we'll send before you, yeah. we publish. Yeah. So. Okay, see thank you. you so much. Yeah, uh, it was nice to talk to you. All right, so.